way up in the Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here. My name is Skip Rutherford. I'm Dean of the Clinton School. And welcome to another uh, in a great series that Nikolai de Pippa brings to us. Um, and, and tonight is certainly one of great interest. I remember as a kid um, having nuclear weapon drills and, and sitting under our desk, uh, really believing that that was going to protect us in the event that the Russians came calling. I remember watching with awe or hearing with awe about the Cuban Missile Crisis and the thought that these weapons could be 90 miles uh, from our border and that America could be attacked. And I remember as a young parent on the night of September 19, 1980, when a Titan II missile exploded uh, in a silo near Damascus, Arkansas, with a nine megaton warhead sitting on its top, uh, many times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. And as one of the airmen who was working on it told me, I said, well, what if that warhead explodes? And he said on the phone that night, it will be quick, which was not very encouraging. Um, but when you think of what happens in catastrophic disasters and what do you do? And we've all seen some of the catastrophic movies that depict some of those disasters. What, what happens? Uh, in his book, Raven Rock, Garrett Graff explores that and talks about the government plans to survive and rebuild after a catastrophic attack on the United States soil. Again, you don't think that is possible, but again, I would remind you that there was another missile test from North Korea today. Uh, Garrett is a journalist, he's a historian, he's an educator, former editor of the Washingtonian, former editor of Politico magazine, the first blogger to receive credentials to cover the White House. And in 2011, he wrote uh, an interesting book called The Threat Matrix, Inside Robert Mueller's FBI and the War on Global Terrorism. Um, probably knows more about Robert Mueller than any journalist uh, uh, alive today because of the extensive interviews that he had with him and Jim Comey. That is not the subject of tonight's conversation. However, uh, I'm sure he would be glad to visit with you uh, after the program to talk about it. But what we do need to talk about is what happens in the event of a major catastrophe and what happens to our government. Ladies and gentlemen, author Garrett Graff. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back in Little Rock uh, and to be speaking at the Clinton School tonight uh, wearing one of my other hats. Uh, I am the chair of the board of the National Conference on Citizenship, which works on civic engagement issues. Uh, and so I uh, particularly appreciate the uh, Clinton School's dedication and effort uh, on civic engagement and inspiring a next generation of leaders. Um, as, uh, as Skip said, I, um, I'm here tonight to talk uh, about uh, my most recent book, uh, Raven Rock, uh, the history of the US government's doomsday plans. Um, it, but it's been sort of a funny couple of months uh, traveling the country talking about it. Uh, because what most people actually do want to talk about is not my most recent book, but my last book before that, um, when I wrote about a uh, obscure figure that six years ago no one actually cared about, uh, named Bob Mueller. So I'm happy to, to chat uh, about that afterwards. Um, this is a book 
uh, Raven Rock that came about uh, because of the work that I'd been doing uh, for most of the last dozen years in Washington covering national security uh, and the, the US government and politics. And in Washington, these plans, which are collectively known as continuity of government, uh, are something that you sort of regularly bump up against uh, in other contexts. Uh, these plans still exist today. Uh, and in writing other stories, I would talk to officials who on 9-11 had been evacuated out to the mountain bunkers around Washington, uh, or talk to people who were part of these plans in the Bush and Obama years, uh, you know, who had the, these designated uh, helicopters that would find them wherever they were in Washington uh, in the event of a catastrophe and drop down and evacuate them. And even for one story, uh, when I was working at Washingtonian Magazine, I actually got to fly with the first helicopter squadron of the US Air Force, which is based at Andrews Air Force Base and is uh, up there in the skies over the Capitol on a daily basis, literally practicing for nuclear war. Um, and their blue and gold helicopters blend in with sort of all of the other helicopter traffic. And people don't really realize that they, these helicopters are literally up there uh, you know, preparing for a catastrophe that has not yet arrived. But what actually got me launched on the book project was a morning uh, when I was at Washingtonian and one of my colleagues uh, brought into my office the badge of a U.S. intelligence officer that he had found on the floor of one of the transit parking garages uh, on his morning commute. And he said, you cover this stuff. I'll bet you can figure out how to get this back to this guy. He's probably having a really bad day, having arrived at the office uh, without his employee badge. And so I start looking at the badge. And when I turn it over, on the back, there are uh, evacuation instructions. Uh, and I get on Google Maps and, and Google Satellite, and I begin to sort of follow this drive set of driving directions out into the uh, out into West Virgi out uh, uh, Virginia, out into West Virginia, and it ends on uh, this Google satellite mountain that you can sort of very clearly see this road heading up the hill. Then there's a chain link fence, a guard shack, about a hundred more yards of road and then a massive set of concrete bunker doors that, and the road disappears into the side of the mountain. And uh, this was a mountain that I had never heard of. Uh, it's not on any maps. Uh, it uh, was something that I sort of instantly realized uh, this is part of the modern continuity of government system. These are part of the new set of bunkers that have been built up since 9-11. And it launched me on this uh, sort of exploration of uh, sort of how these plans came about. And what has been a general theme in my writing over the last dozen years, sort of each of my books has been uh, about how technology transforms institutions. My first book, on the 2008 presidential race was about how technology was transforming uh, electoral campaigning. And then that FBI book that I mentioned was really the story of how technology and globalization had reshaped the FBI. And that this book really is the story of how one very specific technology transformed one very specific institution. And it's the story of how nuclear weapons changed the presidency. And we sort of forget today and don't really think about how much of the architecture and the infrastructure around the modern presidency is the result and the cause of the arrival of nuclear weapons. That for much of America's history, the, the presidency was a much slower institution that the president uh, you know, would regularly travel outside of Washington for days, weeks, months uh, at a time. 
and would be largely out of communication for large periods of that time. As late as 1935, FDR, when he uh, dedicated the Hoover Dam, his motorcade got lost on the way back to Las Vegas and he just disappeared in the canyons around Las Vegas. And no one knew where the president might next appear, how long he was going to be gone, or where he was if you needed to get a hold of him. As late as January 1945, when Harry Truman took office as vice president, the vice president didn't receive any Secret Service protection that the, pre the vice president sort of wandered around Washington completely unmolested uh, and uninteresting to the rest of Washington. And the thinking was sort of as long as you could get in touch with the vice president in, say, a 24-hour period, why on earth would you need the vice president more rapidly than that? But then by that very summer, you begin to have the arrival of the atomic age, and you have the arrival of a new set of technology that compressed time and space in such a way that the presidency has existed almost ever since on a hair-trigger alert that could allow the president in a, any 15-minute window to launch a retaliatory strike on Russia, China, North Korea, or any other adversary uh, that we face. And that what we sort of forget is that so many of the majestic toys of the modern presidency, the armored limousine, uh, like President Clinton's right around the corner here, uh, Marine One and Air Force One are really tools that allow the president to stay in communication such that he can launch that nuclear strike uh, and be in contact with the Pentagon wherever he is, whether it's driving down a street in Washington, whether it's flying in a helicopter, or whether he's on the golf course. When you see those photos of the president, uh, any president, I'm not picking any specific president here, uh, on the golf course. Uh, the president's in that first golf cart, the second golf cart is Secret Service, and the third golf cart in the row is the president's military aide carrying the nuclear football, the black briefcase that allows him access to all of the nation's nuclear codes. And I'm going to, uh, I'll come back and talk about the, the, the nuclear briefcase um, a, a little bit more, but this is, it, it, in a way, the story of the modern, uh, the, the creation of the modern world, the, this planning uh, over 70 years for a war that has not yet ever come, thankfully, has reshaped our modern world in ways that most of us don't really understand. That the story of continuity of government, of these doomsday plans, is the story of an unfolding technology revolution that, the, uh, that all of us today, on a daily basis, use the internet, which is uh, perhaps the greatest legacy of America's doomsday planning, that it was the Pentagon's desire for a decentralized communications network that would survive a nuclear attack that led to the original investments that gave us the internet. That the world's first chat program uh, the forerunner of Slack, of AOL Instant Messenger, of Facebook Messenger, uh, of texting, uh, was designed by FEMA, which was the agency that ran these plans during the Cold War and continues to run these plans today. Uh, that was a, a program designed uh, by FEMA called Emissari that was a tool for the FEMA's bunkers to communicate about uh, stockpiles in, in various parts of the country in wartime. And that the original reason that it was built as a chat program with character limitations, the, the forerunner, if you will, of the 140 character tweet was FEMA's realization that they didn't want their employees writing long government memos inside of their chat programs and so they kept a short character limit on it to speed communication in wartime. And beyond the information superhighway, this is also uh, one of the largest physical legacies of any government set of plans 
uh, in the United States today, that the 41,000 miles of interstate highway were originally conceived during the Eisenhower years as a way to speed the evacuation of urban areas in the event of a Soviet uh, nuclear strike and to speed the movement of war material and stockpiled material around the United States. That the original name for our highways, uh, many people today forget, the original name for the limited access paved road bill as it moved through Congress was the National System of Interstate and Defense Highways. If you are of a certain generation, you may even remember that the first generation of interstates in the United States actually had signs on the entrance ramps saying in the event of enemy attack, this road will be closed to all but the military. This was also the era when we began as a nation to t keep mass secrets for the first time. That this was the first time uh, where we began to keep secrets for an indefinite period of time, necessitating the creation of the sort of out of control government classification and secrecy system that we now know that has 1.2 million Americans with top secret clearances, a group larger than the entire population of Maine, Hawaii, Idaho, or 10 other states. That these systems of confidential, secret, top secret, SCI, ESI, and all of the other classification code words began during the atomic age with the original meaningful clearance, known as the Q clearance, which was the original gateway to the nation's atomic secrets. The stories of this era is also incredibly relevant to us today because this is where uh, leaders like Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney uh, learned the instincts that guided the way that they responded to 9-11. Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld were some of the leaders of these programs during their time as White House Chiefs of Staff in the 1970s. Uh, and at the Pentagon uh, when Rumsfeld was Secretary of Defense the first time around. And that both men participated in the 1980s in a program known as the Presidential Successor Support System, one of the most secretive plans of the Reagan years, which held that uh, teams of former government officials who were back in private life were de pre-designated as the emergency staffs to presidential successors around the country. So that uh, with the understanding that if a cabinet official or a congressional official ended up being the sole surviving presidential successor, they would be ill-equipped to step into leading the nation in the midst of a war. And so, uh, Reagan's administration came up with the idea of setting up these shadow government teams who would be waiting in the bunkers when these presidential successors arrived. And that these teams, the PS3 teams, drilled continuously through the 1980s, disappearing from their private lives uh, to go off and train in the bunkers aboard these airborne command posts, to train in desert camps and other austere conditions around the country for days and even weeks at a time each year, such that if in the 1980s you had been the Secretary of Agriculture or the Secretary of Commerce uh, or the Secretary of Education uh, who was whisked away during a nuclear war to one of these bunkers, you would have found Dick Cheney or Donald Rumsfeld or another dozen uh, similar officials waiting there to introduce themselves as your pre-designated chief of staff to run your disaster wartime government. And it was that these instincts honed aboard the presidential doomsday planes, the fleet of converted 747s known as the night watch planes that the presidents, uh, that the officials like Rumsfeld and Cheney learned how they would respond to an emergency like that we did see during 9-11. It's hard today, sort of going back and talking about this history, to sort of think about just how present these fears were 
during the Cold War. Uh, we, we now know how the Cold War ends. We know that the Soviet Union collapsed uh, with relative peace and, and that the Soviet Union was never quite as strong militarily or economically as we feared it was during the height of the Cold War. And we know how at the end of the Cold War these uh, nuclear arsenals had grown out of any uh, imaginable proportion to tens of thousands of thermonuclear weapons capable of wiping all life from the planet Earth. And so it's weird to go back to those first 20 years of the Cold War in the Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy years, when actually for much of that period we thought that atomic war would be uh, both an almost foregone conclusion, but also something that would be relatively survivable that we would have, that we were talking about bombers and not missiles, that we were talking about atomic bombs, not hydrogen bombs. And we were talking about dozens or a hundred or two of these weapons, not tens of thousands. And so with these plans began during an era when we sort of thought, okay, like maybe we would see a dozen atomic bombs go off in the United States. We might see a few dozen, we might see 60 go off in the United States, but that most of the United States would survive. And so the nation, uh, and those of you of a certain generation, remember sort of uh, just how prevalent those fears of nuclear war were during the early years of the Cold War. The duck and cover drills in elementary school where Bert the Turtle would tell you that if you just got low enough under your elementary school desk, you would survive the atomic bombing of your town that you probably, uh, some of you have parents who uh, built fallout shelters in basements or backyards and stocked them with uh, Hawaiian punch and cereal and the other sort of uh, miracle foods of that era. And that these were uh, done at an industrial scale sort of un unimaginable today where the U.S. government, uh, you know, marked thousands of fallout shelters uh, with those orange and brown signs that you can sort of still see rusting on post offices and elementary schools, that the U.S. Department of Agriculture manufactured 165 million tons of survival crackers with companies like Nabisco and Kroger and hid them away in sealed tins inside those fallout shelters with the idea of uh, you would, uh, the, the food that we would all eat after doomsday. And that with those crackers uh, were sort of emblematic of sort of this, uh, this fascination with these plans that make so much sense on paper and make so little sense when you actually speak them out loud. Where the, 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 the survival biscuits uh, were 125 calories apiece and that each person in a shelter would have gotten six per day during the two weeks that you were expected to live uh, underground before you could return to the surface. The instruction booklet that came with the crackers. I love the idea of the government bureaucrat sitting down in 1958 to write an instruction manual on how to eat a cracker. But the cracker instructions suggested that since there wasn't going to be a whole lot to do in the fallout shelter, you should stretch out the crackers over the course of six meals over the course of the day, one cracker per day, uh, one cracker per meal. That families got uh, at home, some of you may even remember bringing these home from elementary school, sort of these, uh, these helpful uh, brochures about sort of how your family should plan for nuclear war. That the schools in New York City distributed uh, dog tags to all of their school children so that their, the children would be more easily identifiable 
uh, after uh, the nuclear holocaust hit. The schools in Chicago didn't go so far as distributing dog tags. They instead sent home recommendations to the parents that they tattoo their child's blood type on their torso, not the arms or the legs, because those could be blown off, but to put it on the torso so that when the officials came around with these pre-printed triage tags that designed for nuclear war, they would be able to write down sort of where each body was found in the condition uh, of the injured. That then after you went, uh, you came out of the fallout shelters, the, the government had imagined this whole strange post-apocalypse analog of the peacetime government where you would flee from the ur destroyed urban centers out into the nation's national parks, where the National Park Service would run refugee camps because national parkland would be largely untouched by the atomic war. And there you would be given form 810 from the US Post Office, these cards printed in post offices uh, around the country, which was the safety notification card where you filled out your name and the refugee camp where you were living and listed the family members that had survived with you and then mailed it to someone that you wanted to tell that you had survived nuclear war and that the post office would then collect all of these cards back and be able to assess who was still alive in the United States and who had died. The good news is that postage isn't necessary. Uh, and so as you plan your bug out kits, you can leave the forever stamps behind because it turns out you don't actually need the forever stamps forever. And that the US Department of Agriculture, in addition to these uh, detailed um, plans for the survival biscuits, had carefully calculated uh, state by state how, uh, how crops would be affected by nuclear war, sort of uh, how much of the crops would still uh, be salvageable during different parts of the season, how many man days of food would be remaining in the wildlife, in the wild fowl, and also the domestic canine population in the United States to survive uh, the months until food production was able to get back to normal in the United States. Nebraska even went so far as to practice uh, and, and building uh, fallout shelters for cows and running experiments of putting cows underground to see how nuclear war shelters would keep their uh, uh, to, to keep their milk producing. The answer, as it turns out, which might not surprise you, is cows don't particularly notice whether nuclear war has occurred or not, or whether they are living in a barn or living underground. And that these plans uh, encompassed every aspect uh, uh, of American life, that uh, it, even beyond the, the Park Service and the Post Office, uh, wow. Dwight Eisenhower lined up private citizens who would step in as super czars of nationalized industry, sort of men with pre-written executive orders and executive authorizations who would announce themselves as the head of, our, of nationalized transportation agencies, nationalized uh, manufacturing, uh, you know, r r uh, uh, wages and labor, uh, and, and even housing. And that these plans, uh, you know, encompass sort of a much wider set of people than, than we really imagine. That sort of part of one of the changes uh, of this era was the transformation from the pre of the presidency from what we think of as the president, the person that we elect after on the first Tuesday after the first Monday every four years, to what it now encompasses, which is the office of the presidency, which is a group that actually in 
includes hundreds of individuals from across the country, not just the president, the vice president, speaker of the house, president pro tem of the Senate, and the cabinet officials uh, as, as we sort of think of presidential succession. But each cabinet office has its own line of succession now that can stretch 15, 20 people deep, such that in the event of a catastrophic attack on Washington, a very odd assortment of people would emerge across the country and announce themselves as the leaders of the United States. People who include the US attorney for the Northern District of Illinois, the top federal prosecutor in Chicago, the UN ambassador in New York, and the head of the Savannah River Operations Center for the Department of Energy outside Savannah, Georgia. Uh, and of course, if something happened to New York, you would then very quickly get into the ambassador to the UK, uh, the ambassador to Japan, and other high-ranking members of the State Department, that these people would sort of suddenly be the highest-ranking officials in the United States, which would come as a surprise to most of us as we listen to them announce themselves that this set of plans uh, evolved from the 1950s and 60s and these really grand ambitions of saving so many uh, people uh, uh, in, in urban areas, in urban centers, and sort of gradually shrunk in ambition as they were overtaken by faster missiles and more plentiful nuclear weapons to what the modern presidential plans and executive branch plans are, which is swooping down in these helicopters and evacuating a small set of government officials to mountain bunkers and command posts around Washington. But that over time, this network of command posts encompassed this sort of fascinatingly strange set of planes, trains, ships, and bunkers that through much of the 1960s and early 1970s, there were two national emergency floating command posts, the USS Wright and the USS Northampton, that stood station off the Atlantic coast where the president would have been evacuated to one of these uh, floating White Houses where he could have led nuclear war. One of the odd quirks of the system is that that was actually where Bob Woodward, the Watergate journalist, uh, did his naval service was a, uh, as one of the emergency action officers aboard the floating command posts. So if Lyndon Johnson had ever actually declared nuclear war, uh, he would have arrived at the ship to find Bob Woodward standing there to tell him how to execute it. That we kept this fleet of uh, airborne command posts known as looking glass in the air 24 hours a day, seven days a week from February 1962 until 1992 that one of these planes was always flying above the United States with a one-star general aboard who had the power and the authority that if everyone on the surface of the United States had been killed, he still could launch all of the nation's remaining nuclear weapons. The president had that fleet of 747 Nightwatch planes uh, that date back to the late 1970s and early 1980s, and that these planes actually still exist today, and that uh, they follow the president wherever he goes around the world, and that right now, as we are standing here, sitting here, uh, one of these planes uh, is sitting on the runway, uh, standing alert, either at Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, or at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. It is fully staffed, its engines are running, and it is ready to launch with 15 minutes warning to rendezvous with the president wherever he lives and allow him to run nuclear war from the sky for up to three days. 
that this is a series of plans that continue even to the present day in ways that sort of we don't imagine and we don't think about. Uh, e even though they sort of continue to, or, or would have a very profound effect on our lives and our country in the event of a catastrophe, that the mountain bunkers, the three main government bunkers, uh, at the peak of the Cold War, there were more than 100 of these bunkers around the country uh, in almost every state in the Union. Uh, but the three big ones, Raven Rock, the name of the book, uh, in uh, Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, Mount Weather, a bunker in Berryville, Virginia, about 80 miles west of Washington, and then the NORAD bunker in Cheyenne Mountain, uh, which some of you might uh, be familiar with from the movie War Games. These are uh, mountain bunkers of almost unimaginable scale. Uh, the hollowed out mountains with a freestanding city standing inside of it. Uh, buildings capable of holding three to 5,000 individuals apiece uh, with everything that you could possibly uh, want for nuclear war, that there are uh, you know, massive underground reservoirs, hospitals, cafeterias, um, uh, communications facilities, police departments, fire departments. Um, the NORAD bunker in Cheyenne Mountain today even has a, a Subway fast food restaurant. Uh, so that after the apocalypse, uh, the Air Force personnel inside the mountain could continue to enjoy $5 footlongs. <laughs> um, I, I sort of love uh, the uh, in, in the Christopher Guest movie about these plans, they center on the subway employee who happens to be working the eight-hour shift when nuclear war actually happens. And I just sort of have this, this uh, vision of sort of what this person's life would be like as the one fast food worker in America who survives nuclear war. Um, and, and, and this sort of ends up being uh, uh, this incredibly strange chapter uh, of American history that we almost forget about on a daily basis. Uh, and, and it sounds uh, you know, quite comical when I talk about it, uh, it, it, except that it is sort of anything but, that these were literally the plans for the end of the world. Uh, and that the, they were so carefully honed and so carefully thought about, in part because when you think about what it takes to preserve America, it ends up very quickly becoming a very existential question of what is America. Are you trying to preserve the presidency? Are you trying to preserve the three branches of government? Or even as the US government thought it through, are you preserving the historical totems that have bound us together generation by generation? Such that at the Library of Congress, they carefully sat down and rank ordered their artifacts so that they knew in the event of nuclear war, they would evacuate first George, uh, they would evacuate first Lincoln's Gettysburg Address before they grabbed George Washington's military commission that at the National Archives, there they would evacuate the Declaration of Independence before they evacuated the Constitution. And in perhaps my sort of favorite detail from all of the research that I did was that through the Cold War in Philadelphia, there was a specially trained team of park rangers whose job it was to evacuate the Liberty Bell in the event of a Soviet nuclear attack. And I just, again, sort of have this mental image of the park rangers driving off into the mountains of Appalachia with Liberty Bell swinging in the back of their pickup truck and then getting there and being like, no, 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 I swear, the crack was there before we left Philadelphia. But th this sort of ends up actually, I think, being this really fascinating idea to think about and sort of this realization uh, uh, of fundamentally what America really is. 
which is it's more than sort of any of us. It's more than any single generation. It's more than any single set of elected officials. It is an idea. And so sort of all of these plans are fundamentally focused not on how many people survive, not even on who necessarily survives, but ensuring fundamentally that the idea of America survives. I think I might wrap there uh, and open it up to questions. There are sort of a, a thousand different directions that I can go um, with this and happy to open it up. Um, and I think we have uh, a microphone. We do, and we have microphones uh, for the uh, audience. So uh, there's gotta be a lot of questions about this. So everybody, if you please, if you have a question, raise your hand. Who's got, yes, question right here. Wait for the microphone, please. I just had a quick question. Do you know if there are any plans to take animals into these bunkers, you know, like a modern day ark or something? Um, so no, um, uh, other than the relatively short lived experiment uh, of the cows um, in, in Nebraska. Um, but sort of part of what is so interesting about these plans is really just how focused they were which is they really were just, to the, the evacuation plans were totally focused just on the, the officials themselves, um, which presented a problem with the literal very first emergency evacuation drill that the United States conducted that is still unremedied today, which is spouses are not included. So in the summer of 1954, during Operation Alert, when uh, Dwight Eisenhower and his cabinet evacuate out to an undisclosed location that we now know was Mount Weather, they brought with them all of their secretaries, but none of their wives. <laughs> and I found a newspaper article about how the wives spent the day playing cards in a, what they described as a very chilly atmosphere waiting for their husbands to come back uh, and explain to them precisely why they weren't going to be included in these plans. But it was in fact something that was never addressed. Um, and, and, it, and, and, it, and it sort of immediately presents this, in, uh, this very poignant question of would any of these officials actually have evacuated in that moment? Would they have actually stood up and left their families? And Earl Warren, when he was Chief Justice of the United States, he took over at the Supreme Court and the Office of Emergency Preparedness came and gave him one of these evacuation passes. And he, uh, and he said, I don't see a pass here for Mrs. Warren. And the official sort of stammered, and he's like, well, you know, uh, we only have room for the top 2,000 officials in the U.S. government. And he said, well, now you have room for the top 2,001, because I'm not going to go. And he handed back his pass, and he n never would have evacuated. Um, it, and Congress uh, had their own relocation bunker in uh, the Greenbrier. I don't know if any of you have ever had the chance to tour it. It's now open as a tourist attraction and actually a really fascinating uh, place. Uh, again, they built the bunker only for Congress and for staff. And uh, then they realized it was gonna be real hard to get those members of Congress to uh, leave their families. And so they built an, a secondary space um, outside of the blast doors uh, for families to attend uh, as well, um, which again, I think would have been a very unpleasant conversation uh, for, for many of those senators and representatives. But that this, this is actually sort of still very much a plan, uh, a problem with the plans today. Um, and that I had, um, I was talking to someone who was a part of these plans um, during the Obama years. Um, and there was literally a, a helicopter that was designated to find him wherever he was in Washington, drop down, swoop uh, him up, and, and take him to uh, one of these bunkers, um, all of which are still operating and fully staffed 24 hours a day today. 
Um, and he said to me, you know, I have two young daughters, and if anyone thinks that if that helicopter lands at my daughter's soccer game on a Saturday morning, that I'm going to uh, sort of run off to the helicopter and leave them behind, uh, it, you know, they're crazy. Like, there's no way I'm leaving my family. And it's and it sort of um, it sort of raised this question uh, during the Cold War, uh, as uh, as I heard someone say, you know, the the challenge is when these evacuations happen, you have to be really sure that it's actually nuclear war. Because one way or another, there's no going back to your family. <laughs> All right, uh, question. Roby, right here at the back. Yeah, was there a, like a, a founding father of this original plan? Was there like a one person that you kind of could point to and say that was the, the one person that kind of started the conversation or got this whole process moving? Uh, yeah, so it was... Um, uh, it was mostly sort of Truman and Eisenhower. Um, and it was, uh, we actually learned a lot, uh, sort of the earliest stages of the, this, these plans, we actually imported from Britain um, with sort of Churchill's experience and the British government's experience during World War II. And sort of the plans that they had made for a Nazi invasion of uh, across the channel. Um, and then uh, some of you may have been to Churchill's war rooms, uh, the, the cabinet war rooms under Whitehall, sort of the bunker complex there that he ran World War II from. You know, Eisenhower had been there, um, you know, obviously during World War II and was sort of well acquainted with this as a model for sort of how government could function. Uh, underground, but the, there's sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, these plans sort of grew up iteratively um, as we sort of learned, you know, how this technology was going to affect us. I mean, sort of part of what is so strange about looking back on this is like one of the ways that we tested whether these bunkers would work in the early years was like we literally blew up nuclear bombs next to them to see if they would survive. Um, it, it, we in the Nevada test site, the desert north of Las Vegas, for most of the 1950s, you know, we exploded dozens of nuclear bombs uh, in the desert there, where we would sort of build, uh, you know, small towns and then uh, explode an atomic bomb and sort of see what was left. Uh, you know, we would build bunkers and then explode a nuclear bomb and and see what was left. Um, you know, sort of most people today don't, don't realize that actually before casinos, the original tourist attraction in Las Vegas was you went to Las Vegas in the 1950s and you woke up early in the morning and went to the roof of your hotel and watched the, the mushroom clouds uh, rise over the desert to the north. That, that, was, that this was sort of a national pastime uh, that you could sort of go out and watch a nuclear bomb explode in Las Vegas. Uh, yes, ma'am, right here. And then there's, we got, we'll get you next. Yeah, we'll go to her and then we'll come to you. Well, uh, given the information that you have given us, and it, apparently it's pretty globally known that we have bunkers and we know where they are. So with today's ability to zero in on any one space, how safe are these bunkers? in today's uh, military um, scope. And what happens? Do you have to go in and build a safer bunker continually every now and then? Uh, so that's how we actually ended up uh, with, uh, with the plan to put the president aboard uh, or, the, or a successor uh, aboard these doomsday planes. That's sort of the only safe place uh, in modern technology is actually up in the air. Um, and that, that's, uh, that's actually something that you, you saw on 9-11, uh, where President Bush was in Sarasota, Florida. He was put aboard Air Force One uh, and basically hidden in the sky over the United States. Um, you know, sort of we, uh, it, it's sort of a, a fascinating cha mini chapter in this, which is, uh, you know, there is a tension at the heart of these plans that you can either be in control or you can be secure. 
uh, and you can't be both. And that was sort of always true. Um, and that we saw that on 9-11, that, that President Bush, um, you know, actually very much wanted to go back to Washington. Uh, and was prohibited by the Secret Service and the military, whose job it is to protect the office of the presidency, not the president himself, but the office of the presidency. And that we sort of, we, you know, if you, if you remember that, like <coughs> President Bush got tremendous criticism that day for not being Rudy Giuliani, you know, not marching right down to the smoking ruins of Ground Zero and proclaiming, you know, uh, you know, America is unbowed. Uh, but actually, President Bush did exactly the thing that the President of the United States is supposed to do as the Commander in Chief, uh, which is he sort of, you know, disappeared into the the cog system, uh, if you will. Um, it, and and it's sort of in, interesting because each country. Uh, you know, has sort of dealt with this problem on their own, um, which, you know, we have this incredibly elaborate system of planes and the office of the presidency of dozens and scores and hundreds of officials to ensure that there's sort of always going to be someone left in command. Every major power in the world has their own set of COG plans. Uh, and they reveal some sort of fascinating, you know, national differences. Um, in, in the bunkers in the UK during the Cold War, for instance, they stocked China tea sets to ensure that not even nuclear war would stop British officials from being able to take tea in the afternoon. In uh, the Canadian bunker uh, at uh, CFS CARP, Canadian Forces Station CARP, the sort of massive bunker in the Canadian tundra, uh, they built a fully stocked uh, CBC broadcasting facility uh, that included a rather extensive selection of jazz vinyl records. And I sort of love the idea of, you know, the CBC employees sitting there and like choosing which jazz records he wanted to bring with him to the apocalypse. Um, but, but Britain actually was very concerned, uh, remains concerned today about the possibility that you know, the UK is a small, uh, a small island and that all of its government could actually be wiped out in a, a nuclear attack um, in, a, in a way that in the United States it's sort of just geographically too large uh, for the entire country to be adequately targeted. And so they came up with uh, a system that are, that's known as the letters of last resort which is the first thing that a British prime minister does, still to, de to this day, after uh, being granted uh, the role by the, the queen, is he or she sits down and handwrites four letters, one to the commander of each of the four nuclear submarines in the UK. And those letters are sealed inside of an envelope and put inside of a safe, inside of another safe, on each of those submarines. And the, they contain two pieces of information. The first is a checklist for determining whether the UK has been destroyed. And we don't know what's on the checklist, um, uh, but it includes things like BBC Four not broadcasting for X number of days. Um, and there's sort of this whole series of things that have to be on this checklist before the UK can be sort of officially destroyed. And then after that is this handwritten letter of last resort that lays out the Prime Minister's wishes for what the disposition of the nuclear submarine should be after the destruction of the entire country. So do they uh, launch their missiles? Do they take the submarine to Australia or New Zealand? Do they bring it to the United States? Do they not launch at all, figuring at that point there's nothing worth uh, retaliating further about because deterrence has failed? That we, these letters are all destroyed the moment a new prime minister comes to office and that in the entire history of the, uh, the UK's nuclear program, we have never known 
what any of the instructions are in the letters of last resort. Yes, ma'am, we have a question right there. Um, I'm wondering about the cost of um, building the infrastructure to be able to um, implement these plans, yep. but also the yearly cost of maintenance and I guess being prepared? Yeah, so I, th so I think that the short answer is we don't have any idea. And, and I don't mean that based on classified information. Um, I mean, I literally don't think the government knows how much it costs to run this system. Um, that it is spread across so many different budgets. Um, it, it is spread uh, you know, across so many different systems, some of which have peacetime applications, some of which are only wartime applications. Um, in round numbers, um, based on my uh, calculations, I think it costs us about $2 billion a year to, to run uh, the, the COG system. Um, but that doesn't include personnel costs. It doesn't count the people who are standing watch inside Raven Rock 24 hours a day. It doesn't count the crew aboard the doomsday plane, uh, you know, sitting on that runway. Um, it, it is over the course of the Cold War, it is uh, many multiples of hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and in sort of very strange and unlikely places, um, which, which is part of what, what makes it uh, so complicated to calculate. Um, as I said, FEMA and its predecessor agencies, uh, or the agency that has been in charge of primarily running these plans, and that most people don't realize that FEMA, which we think of as the people who show up after the flood or the hurricane, um, is primarily a continuity of government uh, agency uh, with a classified budget that we don't know how much it is and a large classified staff that runs facilities like Mount Weather as well as regional bunkers around the country in places like Denton, Texas, uh, Thomasville, Georgia, Maynard, Massachusetts, uh, Bethel, Washington. Um, and that actually the only reason that FEMA is the Natural Disaster Response Agency is because it had been planning for nuclear war, and it turned out we didn't have that many nuclear wars. And so it had all of these stockpiles, and it had all of this national expertise that beginning in the 1960s and 1970s, they began to sort of deploy to natural disasters along the way. But as late as the 1980s, for every dollar that FEMA spent uh, planning for natural disasters, it spent $12 preparing for nuclear war. All right. This is, uh, we've, we've run out of time. Oh. Uh, no, but that's okay, because <laughs> we want people to come by and, and buy your book and sign it. But I do want to continue your string of, of appearances where people ask the question, which is based on your knowledge and interviews and expertise of one Mr. Uh, Robert Miller. <laughs> what, uh, what do you see or how do you see this investigation, and not concluding, but ha talk about, if you can briefly, uh, any similarities or the, or, or the way he's conducting this and, yeah. and what could you share with us just briefly on that? So I think, um, obviously, this is sort of a, a huge topic that I can talk about for many hours uh, separately. Um, uh, but I think what we're seeing right now is exactly what we would expect from a Bob Mueller-led investigation, um, which is uh, a very directed and tenacious uh, and thorough prosecution uh, that uh, it will probably be unlike anything that we have seen um, in American history. Sort of the, the thing that I actually sort of point people towards, um, Bob Mueller, after he left the FBI in 2013, uh, you might remember he was hired to, by the NFL to investigate the Ray Rice domestic violence incident. And he was tasked at the time with uh, 
figuring out, if you sort of vaguely remember this, there was the casino video of Ray Rice assaulting, uh, I think it was his girlfriend at the time, fiance later. Um, and sort of uh, there, what had, how the NFL had dealt with that video. And in what ultimately became known as the Mueller report, which uh, I assume will be uh, someday sort of overshadowed by a much more famous Mueller report, uh, he, he had this section in it he had five pages in his in, in the report on the NFL uh, about the handling of who signs for packages in the NFL mailroom. That his team had gone in there, uh, and it, sort of my joke was like, I'll bet Bob Mueller knows things now about the NFL mailroom that the NFL mailroom employees don't know. Um, you know, about how packages arrive, where they come in, where they're stored, how they're signed for, whether it's possible that a package could come in through a different door and thus skip the sign-in procedure, sort of everything you could possibly want to know about how a package physically arrives at the NFL League headquarters. And, and that in, in some ways, uh, that to me is Bob Mueller in, in microcosm, which is sort of someone who is just uh, deeply tenacious in a uh, almost bizarre level of detail. Um, and it's worth pointing out that sort of that's the team that he has built around him also, um, that he has these 17 prosecutors uh, who sort of collectively, uh, they're not names that sort of anyone outside of government knows at all, uh, except that they are inside the, the Justice Department over the last quarter century, uh, probably the most talented team of investigators that has ever been assembled uh, by the Justice Department uh, in, in its history. Um, Aaron Zebley, who was his chief of staff at the FBI, uh, came with him to, to, to private practice, ran that NFL investigation, is now uh, you know, helping to spearhead uh, the special counsel investigation. Uh, Andrew Weissman, who led the Enron task force, um, uh, Michael Dreben, who is uh, perhaps the most experienced appellate lawyer in the history of the Justice Department and has argued more than 100 cases uh, before the Supreme Court. Aaron Zebley, by the way, uh, one of the original agents in New York chasing Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda uh, before 9-11. I tell the story in the uh, in, in my book of when Aaron and his partner Steve Gauden uh, went undercover in the refugee asylum service in South Africa for months to track down uh, and they ended up physically tackling and wrestling to the ground the Tanzania, the, the bomber uh, of the U.S. Embassy in Tanzania. Um, uh, you know, he's got James Quarles, one of the original Watergate prosecutors, uh, who is one of the nation's leading experts on, uh, uh, on um, campaign finance. He's got one of the top attorneys on Russian organized crime, uh, who worked with a task force that I wrote about um, that worked in Budapest that helped put together the case against Dmitry Firtash, uh, who is uh, probably the second best known uh, Russian mob boss, um, who is in Vienna uh, being held on a $174 million bond, which he paid. Um, he, uh, he was able to come up with the $174 million to actually get himself out of jail. Um, awaiting extradition to Chicago for a separate case. Uh, Dimitri Furtash, by the way, uh, someone who went 50-50 on a real estate deal with uh, Paul Manafort in New York. 
um, which is not yet an area that we have seen Bob Mueller get into at all. So I think that there, there's an incredible array of talent here um, uh, on a playing field that Bob Mueller has basically spent his entire life working in. Um, I, I wrote at one point that uh, sort of uh, Donald Trump picking a fight uh, with Donald uh, with uh, uh, with Bob Mueller and Jim Comey is sort of the rough equivalent of uh, after having an unrelated bar trivia disagreement, challenging Usain Bolt to a 100 meter dash. <laughs> well, let's uh, that's pretty good. Uh, let, let's uh, let's thank Garrett and uh, come visit with him and sign his book. Thank you. <laughs>